All right, let's get started. Um, since we're going to move very quickly uh, to our guests. Uh, first of all, to let you know that the Secretary General participated this morning in a wreath-laying ceremony in honor of the women and men who lost their lives while serving United Nations peacekeeping. Since UN peacekeeping opened its first mission 70 years ago, more than 3,700 military, police, and civilian peacekeepers have lost their lives. The Secretary General noted that last year saw the highest number of fatalities in our operations as a result of malicious acts. But the past year has also demonstrated the value of our peacekeeping missions, he said, stressing that the closure of two of them in Cote d'Ivoire and Liberia is a landmark on the road to peace and stability in a region that was once in chaos. Uh, and uh, we do expect very shortly to have with us the Under Secretary's General's uh, Under Secretary's General for uh, Peacekeeping Operations and Field Support, uh, namely Jean-Pierre Lacroix and Atul Khare, and they will be uh, uh, speaking to you uh, just after I uh, uh, complete my portion and uh, take a few questions. The Secretary General spoke yesterday afternoon at the General Assembly's adoption of the resolution on the reform of the UN development system saying that the resolution being adopted ushers in the most ambitious and comprehensive transformation of the UN development system in decades. He said it sets the foundations to reposition sustainable development at the heart of the United Nations and gives practical meaning to our collective promise to advance the sustainable development goals for everyone, everywhere, leaving no one behind. Under the new system, the Secretary General said, national ownership and a strong focus on accountability and results will guide the system every step of the way. He added that UN teams on the ground will now be better able to tailor their presence, capacities, skill sets, and overall response to the member states' priorities. The Secretary General appealed to the member states for their immediate support so that we can hit the ground running on the 1st of January, 2019. This weekend, the Deputy Secretary General will depart New York for Istanbul, Turkey, to attend the inauguration of the Technology Bank for Least Developed Countries, which will take place on Monday in Gebze. From there, she will proceed to Brussels to attend the European Development Days and have bilateral meetings with senior European Union and other officials on the 5th and 6th of June. And on the 6th of June, she will travel to Geneva to attend the meeting of the Board of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. The Deputy Secretary General will return to New York next Thursday. Today, the humanitarian coordinator for the occupied Palestinian territory, Jamie McGoldrick, and the UN Relief and Works Agency Director of Operations in the West Bank, Scott Anderson, joined others in the international community in calling on the government of Israel to seize its plans to carry out the mass demolition and transfer of the Palestinian Bedouin community of Khan al Amr Abu al Hello, located on the outskirts of East Jerusalem in the occupied West Bank. Mr. McGoldrick said that Israel's obligation as an occupying power to protect the residents of Khan al Amr are clear. And Under Secretary General for Political Affairs, Rosemary DiCarlo, is embarking this Sunday on her first mission since taking up her duties last month. From the 5th to the 8th of June, Ms. DiCarlo will visit Addis Ababa to meet with the leadership of the African Union, uh, Som uh, Somalia, and the UN political mission in the country, UNSOM, and Nairobi. Um, during each leg of her trip, she will meet government authorities and the UN presidencies. We expect to have a roundup of her mission next Friday. The UN mission in Libya today called on parties to the Derna conflict to exercise maximum restraint and ensure that they take all precautions to protect civilians. The escalation of fighting in Derna has reached unprecedented levels during the past week, with fighting further encroaching into densely populated areas. Since the 16th of May, at least 17 civilians, including two children, were killed, and another 22, including seven children, were injured in the conduct of hostilities. The number of civilian casualties was the highest in the past two days, with seven killed, and another seven injured on the 30th of May in an explosion as they were attempting to leave the city. And the mission also said today that during the month of May, they documented 101 civilian casualties, including 47 deaths and 54 injuries during the conduct of hostilities, including car and suicide bombings across Libya. The death toll is the highest recorded in 2018. The majority of civilian casualties were caused by shelling, followed by vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices, unidentified explosives, and airstrikes. There's more details online. And our human rights colleagues say that they are appalled at the ongoing violence in Nicaragua, where this week at least 16 people are reported to have been killed and more than 100 injured amid anti-government protests. 
They also expressed concern at the reported arrest and, and detention by the Army of six human rights defenders, including two adolescents, and called on the authorities to ensure their prompt release. They are also extremely concerned at continuing reports of death threats, acts of violence, and intimidation against journalists, students, and members of the Catholic Church, among others. The Office of the High Commissioner reiterates its request made on the 7th of May to the Nicaraguan authorities to be granted immediate access to the country. And our human rights colleagues today called on the Ukrainian authorities to act urgently to protect minority groups, including Roma communities and LGBTI activists, in the wake of a number of serious acts of violence and harassment against them in recent weeks. The Human Rights Office urges the government to, play, to pay closer attention to the actions of extreme right-wing groups throughout the country. In a number of cases, it says they have claimed responsibility for the recent attacks and intimidation. The Human Rights Office adds that the lack of accountability for attacks against minorities and evictions of Roma in previous years has fueled an atmosphere of impunity. Our colleagues urge the government to demonstrate zero tolerance by publicly condemning such acts, investigating all attacks against minorities, bringing per perpetrators to account, and guaranteeing the right to non-discrimination and equality. And shortly after, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we will have right uh, in the next few minutes, the Under Secretaries General for uh, Peacekeeping Operations and Field Support, Jean-Pierre Lacroix and Atul Kare. After that, we shall also have the spokesperson for the President of the General Assembly, Brendan Varma. And then shortly after our briefings at 1.30 p.m., Ambassador Vasily Nebenzia, Permanent Representative of the Russian Federation and President of the Security Council for the month of June, will be here to brief you on the Council's program for June. And then on Monday at 10 a.m. here in this room, there will be a briefing by the UN Environment Program on the launch of the Renewables 2018 Global Status Report. And that is it for me. Uh, I can take a few questions before we turn to our guests. Yes, uh, yes, Mushvik. Thank you very much, Mr. Farhan. As I asked yesterday to uh, spokesperson, Mr. Stefan, that Bangladesh, the extrajudicial killing is going on within 16 days, 125 people face uh, extrajudicial killing by the law enforcement agency in Bangladesh in the name of drug control. One, and second question was, he said he will update me by tomorrow. And second question was, the uh, main opposition leader, Begum Zia, is in prison and the, she is facing very inhuman situation, lack of electricity and providing low quality food. Though she got the bail from the for her, her controversial body, but she did not release from the court because they filed new cases. So what is your observation on these two particular issues? Okay, um, well, regarding your second question, I don't have anything particularly new to say beyond the concerns we'd expressed in the past about, uh, about this process. Regarding your uh, initial question, uh, the UN Office on Drugs and Crime is, is aware of the, the questions that have uh, arisen uh, in the context of the recent activities in Bangladesh. What I can say is the UN Office on Drugs and Crime urges all member states to adhere to their commitments to promote balanced, human rights-based approaches to drug control, in line with the three international drug control conventions and the outcome document of the United Nations General Assembly Special Session on the World Drug Problem. UNODC stands ready to engage with all countries to help bring criminals to justice with appropriate legal safeguards in line with international standards and norms and to promote evidence-based prevention treatment, rehabilitation, and reintegration. Yes. Sure. I'll ask about Burundi and then about this uh, development system reform. Um, I know I'd asked you before about Burundi after the, 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 re the referendum on the Constitution. It said that, that the reports were that it were calm, but it hadn't yet been finalized. Now the Constitutional Court of the government has dismissed all opposition uh, uh, petitions claiming uh, intimidation and arrest during the campaign should invalidate this extension of term limits uh, for Pierre and Krenziza. What is the UN's position now that the, the, the vote is essentially legally final within Burundi? Uh, well, reg regarding the, the referendum, I, I would just refer you to the Secretary General's recent report on Burundi, uh, where he did make it clear that it is Burundi's sovereign right to, m to amend its constitution. At the same time, what we've stressed is that there's no alternative to dialogue and we particularly uh, want uh, uh, the involvement of the uh, East African community and, and, uh, and for their role in the intra-Burundian intra dialogue. And once more, uh, we would like to call for the unconditional participation of all parties in good faith in the next session of the intra-Burundian inter dialogue. And we urge the leadership of the East African community to keep encouraging 
the Burundian stakeholders in this regard. Thank you. But do, does, the, does the UN believe, now that it's seen the draft, the, 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 the text of the amendments and the, the now final vote, that this constitutional amendment is in accord with the Arusha agreements that the UN has worked on, uh, you know, for some years? We, we have been studying uh, this language, but uh, the position I've, I've stated is the one that we have. Okay, and on, on P I wanted to ask you about language. I, saw, I noticed yesterday in the, in the meeting to, on, the, on the development uh, system reform, there was a sort of formal statement of the Secretariat that said, quote, the Secretariat is not in a position to provide a detailed statement of program bu budget implications prior to the finalization of the implementation plan. So I wanted to ask what I was trying to ask Stefan yesterday. What is, ex usually, I mean, at least in my experience, usually the PBI is done before the vote. Maybe this is, you know, I'm sure states agreed to this, but what is the plan for the Secretariat? What's the time frame to actually say how much it's going to cost? Uh, what's happening now? Uh, uh, we're very appreciative of the adoption of the resolution yesterday by the member states. Uh, we had informed the member states in a note of our of the process uh, that we're going through, and what we're going to do now is that we are engaging, as as of now, we're engaging with the fifth committee to provide uh, more information, and we'll do this uh, so that, uh, as the secretary general made clear, we can hit the ground running on the first of January two thousand nineteen. So that's in this May section, in in this in this current session that 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 this information is going to be provided, the PBI. Mm -hmm. Like I said, we, we've started uh, as, of, as of this past day where we're, we're starting our dialogue with the Fifth Committee on this. Yes. Farhan, what is the Secretary General's reaction to the passage of this resolution uh, in, in the Security Council yesterday that basically lays the groundwork for a possible arms embargo and targeted sanctions, given the longstanding view um, of the Secretary General f calling for an arms embargo, but also um, given the objections, uh, I'm sure you saw the Ethiopian ambassador speaking on behalf of IGAD, to the passage of this resolution, saying that it might undermine the peace process. What's your sense of what this resolution well, uh, does? You're aware of the positions that the Secretary General has, uh, has made uh, regarding uh, the peace process in South Sudan and the need to exert the necessary pressure on the leaders uh, who, uh, in his view, ha need to do much, much more and much better uh, in order for there to be meaningful progress towards peace in South Sudan. Uh, so, given that, uh, uh, of course, uh, we, we take note of uh, the passage of this resolution and we'll follow up uh, uh, as, a, as according uh, to uh, the will of the members of the Security Council. Uh, did you have a question? Do you have any latest update on timing for the Gaza resolution passage? No? That, that's outside of our hands and, and secondly, in the hands of uh, the member states. Or maybe I should ask the next group. It seems like the CAR has an enormous amount of peacekeepers who were killed. Yeah. Well, uh, I think our, our guests will be able to talk a lot about uh, the specific challenges of, of different peacekeeping missions. Uh, but uh, yes, regarding, um, uh, regarding the timing of uh, council activities, uh, you will have at 1.30 the, the new president of the Security Council, Ambassador Nimbenzia, and he can share some, shed some light on that. Yes, you, and then you, and then we'll go to the guest. Sure. I, I wanted to ask, to, I guess, follow up on, on, on something Stefan said yesterday about the, the Ghanaian uh, po foreign police unit in, in WOW. Uh, the, Ghana, the, the press in Ghana has this headline, sex scandal, indicted, indicted Ghan Ghanaian police officers resume duties, and says, the Ghana police service says 46 police officers interdicted in South Sudan for allegedly engaging in transactional sex are back at their posts in Ghana. And I just, it seemed inconsistent with what he'd said that some unknown number of, the, of, of those in the foreign police unit were found, at least by OIOS, to have been engaged in, in sexual abuse and exploitation. So is it, is it true that they're all back on the job in Ghana? And how does this uh, consistent with what he said yesterday? Well, what we said, uh, what Stefan made clear was that the contingent of 46 police officers was repatriated to Ghana on the 30th of May. And we're closely following up with the Ghanaian authorities on the accountability of those found uh, responsible for the, for these acts under due process, of course, uh, uh, questions about what what is happening inside Ghana should be addressed to the government of Ghana. Right. Yeah. But, I mean, have you seen in terms of following up about accountability? They're all back on the job. Well, like I said, we're we're in touch with the government of Ghana. Now it's up. Now any questions on how the government of Ghana is handling its responsibilities once they're back inside Ghana should should go to them. Uh, yes, if the car. Then, yes. then we'll go to the guest. Uh, thank you, uh, Farhan. Uh, a new interim administration has taken over in Pakistan following the completion of the term by Pakistan Muslim. Any thoughts 
on, on this uh, development? No, there's no particular comment. As you know, we, we work with, uh, with all of the member governments, and we will do so in this case. And with that, let me turn to our guests. Thanks very much.